Uh, yes. I have to agree with Jan that coming back to Grand Canyon as an archaeologist is kind of the pinnacle of my park service career. I like to be in a backcountry ranger because you're in and around the canyon, but you're constantly calling people out and worrying about who's going to die on you. So, <laughs> so to be able to be in there and working with the resource, it doesn't take any better than that. So welcome, and tonight we're going to talk about the river excavation project that took place in the Grand Canyon between 2007 and 2009. It was a partnership between uh, the Grand Canyon and the Museum of Northern Arizona, and the goal of that project was to excavate nine severely eroded sites along the Colorado River. Tonight we'll talk about our discoveries and our adventures on that trip and the grandest landscape of the world. I provide here just a brief overview of the cultural time periods of the Grand Canyon, and I'll review these again as we talk more specifically about the sites that we excavated in this project. I don't expect you to memorize this. <laughs> I can give it to you as a handout later if you like. First, I'll give a brief overview of that cultural period, period that was identified of sites that were identified during the Colorado River Project. The first of these time periods is called the Archaic. And during this time, which begins about 10,000 years ago, people followed a seasonal round in search of ripening game and hunting animals. Because they were nomadic, and because they lived in small groups, they had limited material possessions. The archaeological evidence they left behind consists mostly of the stone tools they made, including distinctive dart points, which they used with an atlatl, or a throwing stick, one-handed monos, and grinding slabs for processing seeds and other wild foods. In the Grand Canyon, elaborately painted rock art images and, split twig, and the split twig figurine complex are attributed to the archaic people. This period lasted, or ended, about 3,000 years ago. The basket baker people were early farmers, growing corn, and moving less often than the archaic people before them. They often built pit house structures for their homes and stored food in below ground stone lined pits. In the southwest, the earliest pottery is made during the basket maker time. The first pottery is not fired, but consists of clay and organic materials such as grass that's formed into a bowl or other vessel forms and allowed to air dry. This pottery was fragile and could not be used for cooking. Here we see a, late, a lino black iron gray painted pot from later in the, pre, the basket maker period. By the time this pot was made, the technology surrounding ceramic production had improved. This pot was decorated and fired in an outdoor kiln. Other technological advances in the basket maker period include the adoption of the bow and the arrow. The basket maker period ends about 1600 years ago. By the end of the basket maker period, a group many of us have heard of take center stage in the human story of the Grand Canyon. The ancestral Pueblo people were farmers who settled in villages, some large and some small, in the Grand Canyon and other locations in the Four Corners region, such as Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, and Navajo National Monument. Unlike groups before them, the ancient Puebloans gave up a nomadic lifestyle in exchange for a life based on corn and agriculture. The ancestral Puebloan groups living in the Grand Canyon are known as the Cayenta and the Virgin. Some researchers classify the Cojonina people, who were also living in the canyon at that time, as ancestral Puebloan. These people were the ancestors of modern Pueblo tribes. Archaeological evidence tells us that there are more people living in the canyon during the formative or Puebloan period 
than at any other time before or since. We will learn more about these people as we continue our discussion. By 1250s common era CE, ancestral Puebloan people have left the canyon to continue their agricultural life elsewhere. At about the same time, ancestors of the Havasupai, Wallapai, and Paiute people are moving into the canyon and are largely following the nomadic lifestyle, collecting wild foods and tending small seasonal gardens. Pueblo people continue to travel to the canyon for trade, to gather resources, and for other purposes. We find evidence of their travels in the artifacts they left behind. John Wesley Powell was the first scientist to report on the presence of archaeological materials within the Grand Canyon. On August 16, 1869, he wrote, discovered the ruins of two or three old houses, which were originally of stone laid in mortar. Only the foundations are left. In one room, I find an old kneeling stone, deeply worn, as if it had been much used. A great deal of pottery is strewn about, and old trails, some of which are deeply worn, are seen. He was speaking of what we call Bright Angel Pueblo, located near the Colorado River in the vicinity of Phantom Ranch. The Gila Pueblo organization conducted the first scientific studies in the Grand Canyon in 1930 when they excavated the Tucson Moon. Their work was ahead of its time, for they left part of the site unexcavated for future generations. By the 1960s, or sorry, the 1950s, interest in the archaeology of Grand Canyon intensified. Two scientists took the lead in understanding the human history of the area. The first of these men was Dr. Robert Euler, who, who served as the park archaeologist for many years and who jammed trade under. Among other activities, he undertook the excavation of Stanton's Cave in 1969. One of the goals of that excavation was to collect information on the specific <coughs> figurine complex that scientists were just beginning to understand. At the same time, Dr. Douglas Schwartz of the School of Advanced Research began his studies in the Grand Canyon. Among his many studies were excavations at Uncar Delta, the Wahala Plateau, including the Wahala Glades Pueblo, Sky Island, and Wotan's Throne, and Bright Angel Pueblo. Dr. Schwartz's work continues to shape much of our current understanding of Grand Canyon human history. More recent studies in the canyon have continued to build on these early research efforts. Many of these studies now focus on the effects of Glen Canyon Dam on archaeological sites, and they have sought to find ways to mitigate those effects. After years of monitoring archaeological sites and trying to stabilize erosion caused by the effects of the dam, the National Park Service selected nine sites, nine of the most threatened sites, for excavation. Excavation was the only way to salvage the important information these sites contained. Here you see one of the deep gullies, or arroyos, that have formed in some archaeological sites along the Colorado River corridor. After developing a research plan in consultation with the park's traditionally associated tribes and the Arizona State, Hist State Historic Preservation Office, park and museum staff, <coughs> volunteers, and support personnel carefully planned and implemented a logistically complex series of field sessions to excavate the nine sites. I highlight some of the adventures and findings at three of those sites, Furnace Flat, Palisades, and Axe Hill Alcove. These excavations took three years to complete. 